Hey everyone, this is Grandmaster Josh Friedel, and this is another addition to my autopsy series. So I wanted to do a videos on the World Championship. For those of you who are new to my videos, basically what I do is I look at a game where one side lost, and I kind of dissect not necessarily just the worst moves they played, but you know what led to those mistakes and why they ended up losing. But of course, uh, both. Fabiano and Magnus in the World Championship didn't lose any games, uh, at least in the classical chess portion, and that's kind of what I wanted to focus on. Uh, again, part of it, there are many reasons for this. Some of it, they're both very strong, which means that when two very strong players play, uh, the draw is, at least in slow time controls, definitely the most likely result. The other main factor I would say is that they both defend exceptionally well, so even when there are advantages they weren't necessarily taken. And the other main factor is also that I'd say that their offense, as far as when they did have promising positions, they didn't execute in the best way all the time, you know, as well as I've seen them do in the past. Uh, of course, it's still very difficult to win a chess game, but I, I think that both of them definitely had their chances. And overall, I actually found this match to be quite entertaining because a lot of games really went down to the wire and the fact that they ended in draws at least for me personally, is not such a big deal. It was more that, you know, how, how the quality of the games is and also just how interesting they are. And there are some really tedious draws, but most of their draws were actually quite interesting. In any case, instead of looking how did they lose, because obviously they didn't lose, I'm going to focus more on specific chances they had where I think they played, say, an error or played in an incorrect way. And then what we can figure out you know, might be the mistakes, what kind of errors and thinking can lead this way, and how we can prevent it. Now, I'm not really going to pretend that this is what Fabi or Magnus would be doing about these games. I, you know, the, <laughs> to, to, to know exactly what they're missing would be a bit presumptuous of me, just because, okay, first of all, they're much stronger than me, but also to get inside someone else's head is, is very difficult. So instead, what I'm going to focus on is more from the angle of what the mistake kind of is in this situation and also what kind of common thinking problems can lead to this mistake and I actually think that players even of this strength make the same mistakes that you or I do or that amateur players make or even even players maybe not beginners but like players who are even of lower levels they kind of make the same kind of mistakes it's just they obviously make fewer of them and the degree is a little bit smaller it's a bit more subtle but I think a lot of the patterns that we see in their games and in their mistakes actually are in our games as well, just more often and usually a lot worse, and sometimes more embarrassing. In any case, um, I wanted to start with game one, and again, keep in mind, I'm going to be doing it from the perspective of, you know, just how to think about these positions. I'm not really going for, you know, analyzing these positions to death or looking at that, believe me, there are so many videos and, and analysis of these games out there that me contributing another one, okay, I could do it, of course, but that's not really what I'm after. I'm after how can we learn from these games ourselves and take some of their mistakes or some of their moves which maybe weren't the best and kind of figure out, wait, well, do I make that kind of mistake? How can I avoid making this kind of mistake in my own games? And that's kind of the angle I'm going to be taking. So in this game, this was game one, they started off with quite an exciting game. And a lot can be said about the initial part of this game and how it went. And there were definitely many interesting moments, but there are a few I want to break down. So just to be clear, I divided this into two videos. One's going to be from Fabiano's perspective, his mistakes or, you know, moves or idea or thinking processes that I don't agree with. And maybe ones which we can find improvements on. And again, a lot of it is more, not so much that he made mistakes, but that common types of thinking that we do wrong in our own games. Um, but again, one is from Fabiano's point of view and one from Magnus's point of view. So my first video is from the point of view of Fabiano, which is why we are white in this position. And in this position, Fabiano played rook takes f4. It was clear, just to set the scene a little in case you guys weren't following live, that Magnus had used less time and was playing much more quickly and confidently. Fabiano played a little slowly. He played a line which isn't quite the norm. For example, earlier playing queen d2 was more normal, 
But okay, none of this stuff is super important or what I want to focus on. In this position, he's doing just fine. So the normal move here for black, which probably everyone and their mother was expecting, was knight e6. So the rook retreats. And okay, black has a few ways to play. You can castle, it's legal, but most likely black was probably going to sink the knight, play the bishop out, and here white can try bishop h6, and then maybe black trades and tries to castle queenside. White can just double rooks and kind of wait for white to commit before deciding what to do. But this is just normal way to play, just very standard stuff. But Magnus played the move bishop e6. And in this position, I think Fabiano started to go astray. And this is where I find lots of players go astray. When their opponent surprises them out of the opening, and I'm sure we can all relate to this, we tend to sort of react in a bad way a lot of the time. So sometimes we adapt too little, sometimes we adapt too much, sometimes we kind of lose our minds a little bit. And it's one of those reasons why surprises in the opening can be really effective, even at the highest of levels. Now to say that Fabiano lost his mind here is of course incorrect. <laughs> um, definitely don't want to say that, but I don't like the way he played the position and he played it in a way that's actually quite standard against knight e6. He, play, he brought his rook back, which I definitely agree with even here. He brought his queen to d2, he doubled on the f-file, it all looked completely logical. But as we'll see, if we go forward here, rook f2, h6 was played. So you think, what on earth is black doing? Well, the fact is, there's no knight on d4, but at the same time, black saved a couple tempi with that. So black's plan is to play g5 maybe, possibly put the knight on g6 or d7. And as we see in the game, so Fabiano... Uh, played queen d2, and just to illustrate what happened, g5 was played, rook f1 looks totally logical, but Magnus played here, and followed this up by playing knight d7, uh, or sorry, by castling queenside immediately. And his position was really comfortable, really nice, and as we'll see in the game, these rooks in the f-file weren't all that impressive, because this pawn is not really that weak. And even though what Fabiano did was completely typical for the opening and very logical, it just didn't work at all. So, which brings me back to this position. So how do we react when our opponent does something like this? This kind of improving move, I, I say improving, an attempt to improve, on the main line, it's basically predicated on the fact that even though you leave the net on f8, which looks a little bit sad, it can develop later via d7 and you save time because you don't have to put the knight on d4 where quite honestly it's not entirely clear the knight on d4 is super effective so basically black saying look i'm going to leave my knight on f8 maybe bring it to d7 and save that extra tempo when developing my pieces so it's quite a statement to make and it works to perfection when white played the way fabi did where he d played queen d2 and doubled rooks and everything just worked out beautifully for black but this is where adaptation comes in. I think it's extremely important to be able to alter your plans when your opponent switches it up on you. And it's why I kind of, one of my pet peeves in, say, a student's games is when they play only one setup in an opening. Because what that means is that regardless of what their opponent's doing, they just want to complete their setup. Obviously, Fabiano is <laughs> nowhere near this, and he's not even normally a Rosalimo player necessarily so this is not not like a pet system of his where he's only gonna do one thing that's ridiculous and that's almost certainly why he didn't make the mistake but I would say that if a club player had done this this would be my explanation uh, that they're trying to play the same setup they always do when in fact they should adapt to how blacks playing so when we look at the advantages and drawbacks of bishop e6, the advantage, as we mentioned, was saving time. The knight also might be better on e5 than d4, for example. Or maybe it goes to g6 and helps escort the attack. We don't know. Uh, it ended up going to d7, which was logical. But what is the drawback? Okay, for the moment we have this kind of, I call it a Fisher random piece, this knight on f8, because it looks just random. It looks like someone just put it there. Like, no way black put it there on purpose. And... Black's not castled yet, that's definitely something. But how do we actually take advantage? So I don't mind uh, Fabiano's first move, rook f2 is very logical, h6. But in this position, I think he should have completely altered his plan for the game. Rather than playing queen d2, rook f1, I liked playing for d4. 
So what I wanted to do during the game, it, again, I, I like to follow games live and try to guess what they're going to do and, and kind of test myself, my ideas against theirs. As you can imagine, usually my ideas don't measure up very well to theirs, but once in a while I see an idea I like. And here, the idea I liked but couldn't really make it be too great was this one, knight f3. So it looks weird because you just brought your knight to h2, but of course you did it to accomplish f4. So the knight comes back, and the idea is you're going to play for d4 which seems very anti-positional because you're trading off a doubled pawn. But the fact is that if you can get these bishops off, which is the goal, black will deal with weak dark squares. And I don't really consider this pawn a weakness on e4 because it's simply too hard to attack. But the main idea is simply that you trade off the bishops, which as we know when we're facing the two bishops, trading off a pair is a very nice thing. But we also activate our own pieces. So for example, they do would be after queen c7, d4, Castle's queenside, and I think that during when I was analyzing, I wanted rook d2, some move like this, but it might be actually even more clever to play a move like queen a6 with the idea that you have queen a, uh, sorry, queen d3 with the idea of queen a6 check. Uh, so, for example, if black just starts taking everything and tries to win a piece, you actually say haha and you win a piece yourself. Uh, it doesn't seem like such a clever trick, but the fact is that it makes it more more convenient to play. So probably black should just play queen b7. And honestly, it's not a bad position for white. Maybe nothing special. You could play... I'm, I'm not exactly sure um, what the deal is as far as... Uh, like, like, part of the problem here is that you have a slight pin. d5 is possible, but we're dealing with a pawn sack, that kind of thing. So this queen b7 move was actually a little bit annoying. Um, and for sure you can play a move like rook d1 and play this way. But it's not, it's not all that simple. So the idea here is not to play rook d1. Because after c takes, bishop takes, this is pretty much bad for bad for white but instead of rook d1 you can play d5 and sacrifice a pawn this way play rook d1 and you get some compensation you, the king is a little bit off uh, you have this pin going it's a little bit annoying like if black has to take on c3 it's not not exactly ideal in any case I, I was looking at things like this mostly oops I was actually trying to play rook, rook d2 here, was my main line when I was looking at this. And again, I, I saw this, and okay, if knight takes d4, even bishop takes h3, sacks, and weird perpetuals you have to worry about. But even after bishop d7, I just wasn't all that crazy about it. Like, obviously the position is okay, but black's pretty solid, and it's not all that, you know, impressive. But at the same time... I'd say it's a little bit safer than what Fabiano did, who actually ended up in trouble. And definitely, white should be okay here, uh, for sure. Um, it turns out after h6, white even has a more clever move. And I can't claim to have found this one. This was found by, actually, I think Alpha Zero had <laughs> this idea uh, when they were going over it with Sadler. And again, it's, it's not so much that P this is a realistic thing to find, but it's kind of like a, a clever way to show how you can change the position. You can play a4 here. With the main idea that, okay, if black can play knight d7, which might be best, but after a5, at least for a human being, this would be difficult for black, because now you always have to deal with this pawn on a5, and in general, we can agree that white has achieved something. Uh, this pawn is just a nuisance. And if black plays a5, which is the most hu natural human move, now white goes for this idea. And you can see how this structure is a little bit more loose, and it definitely allows for lots of different possibilities. Uh, that black white has for example here. Okay, you can still play rook d2 and it's at the very least not worse I'd say it's probably a better version than what we were looking at but now for example you can play this move Queen b7 and here believe it or not You can actually get away with rook d1 and the reason why is actually quite shocking and again This is not realistic to see in a game, but I, it was such a cool variation. I had to kind of show it <laughs> which is that after here you can allow black to win a piece and simply ignore it. And the point is, because in this position, this, this pawn is on a5, this knight is super secure. And the problem black has is that every piece is completely misplaced. This knight on f8 is horrible, this rook on h8 always hangs. 
It can't go to d7 because of check. So pretty much in this position, obviously if you take and I take, you can just resign immediately. Everything just drops uh, with mate in a few moves. <laughs> Uh, so you have to play king b8 here, and you do allow a check, but you can at least go to a8 and draw. And I have no intention of doing that, so I'm just going to take. And I say, look, I got d5 coming, I have queen g3 check in the air, this rook is misplaced, this knight is misplaced. Believe it or not, black's position is just in ruins. Now, if Fabiano would have seen this, they would have had to search him for uh, wires or something. This is not exactly obvious, but the point still remains as far as, you know, what we can learn from it, which is that I do think it's important to change your plan oftentimes when your opponent tries to be, especially if they try to be more ambitious. If you play the way you usually do against a very ambitious setup, often you just end up with a worse version of what you usually get. So when Fabiano saw bishop e6, and I'm sure he definitely was on his mind, is there a way to take advantage? Is there a way to say, look, you didn't put a knight on d4, so I'm going to actually play it myself. So I thought that this was a really a cool moment. So let's move on to the next game. So this one was actually from game eight. And this was a game where Fabiano really had excellent, excellent chances to win. But unfortunately for him, he could not do so. And this was an amazing game. Uh, both of them were really playing, you know, I, I thought they were playing good chess. I mean, Carlsen definitely played a couple errors. But, for example, Carlsen's last move, bishop c8 to f5, was heavily criticized after the game. First of all, they were playing an awesome, interesting opening. This this uh, classical Sicilian with... Not classical Sicilian, what am I talking about? Sveshnikov Sicilian with... Knight d5 is a really interesting line. Uh, definitely double-edged. In some ways, it resembles King's Indian. And here, Carlsen played bishop f5, which a lot of commentators were really against. And objectively speaking, I'm sure they're correct. But from a human standpoint, bishop, C, five, bishop f5, trying to get your rest of your pieces out, is almost an automatic move. But as is the case in a lot of these concrete positions, what the specifics matter a bit more. And this move was not the best. And again, I'm not so much focusing on Carlsen's moves for now. But just to illustrate how complex the position was, that such a move could be bad at all, that a move like bishop f5. So here, Fabiano played c5, which is the best move in the position, and I'm still criticizing it. I'm not criticizing the move itself, I should be clear about that. He spent 30 minutes here. And to be quite honest, it's an extremely complicated position where probably he's going to need every little second that he has left but he actually made a mistake that i certainly have made many a time i'm sure almost all of us have done which is he spent 30 minutes on a move he pretty much knew he was going to play c5 so i don't advocate playing without thinking ahead or without calculating in general that's a bad policy if you play a move like c5 and like ah i'll leave it to the chess gods it's, it's probably not a great idea but it's also true that most of the time, especially when you have a position this complex, you can't work out every single detail ahead of time. At some point, you have to trust your judgment, trust the lines you've calculated, trust your instincts about the position, your positional intuition and evaluation. There are so many factors that go into every position. And at some point, you have to kind of trust and you know accept the fact that we're not computers and we can't calculate everything. And if C5 is the only move he was looking at, he should play it. I mean, okay, if you spend 8 to 10 minutes, even 15 minutes is maybe permissible because it is such a committal move. But you got to play it quicker than 30 minutes. So spending 30 minutes was actually the bigger mistake. And I think that it's something we do. Now, if you're someone who gets into time trouble every game, that's a problem in of itself. And you have to investigate moments like this because, quite frankly, you're, whether, no matter, you could be the biggest time pressure genius in the world. You could play like Nakamura when you get two minutes on your clock. But if you get that every game, it is costing you points. Hate to be the one to break it to you. It's true. So, whereas if you're someone who doesn't always get into time pressure, but you definitely have moments like this, these are ones to really watch. Because you're going to end up having to make decisions later where you need time and you don't have it. So you're going to have to actually make some rather poor decisions or at least rushed decisions later on in the game. And in, in my mind, this in some ways helped cost it. Now... This is a world championship match. You're going to be 
naturally people take a little bit more time because they're afraid of making a mistake, which is understandable. But just spending 30 minutes here is just not something you can really do in a game. So he did it, and I think it's a good move. You could also play a move like Bishop E2, but okay, if you're going to play C5, you play C5. So Magnus reacted maybe not in the best way, but probably in the best way, and he did it very quickly, which is probably to his credit. He took and took. So he's like, all right, I got a pawn. Show me what you got. Fabiano played rook a d1, bishop d6, and here Fabiano played the move h3, which was maybe his most criticized move of the match. It's uh, definitely a slow move. He's basically saying, look, you can't do anything to me, and then I'm going to clobber you on the e-file, I'm going to bring my pieces in. But this move shocked everyone watching. And again, you, you might ask, like, you know, how can Fabiano, someone that strong, play a move which is slow in a position where, let's face it, when you're down a pawn and your opponent's king is open, playing quicker moves come to mind a lot more. So I think the computer preference is knight c4, queen back, but allowing g4 f3 is a little bit... Uh, I don't know, I, I don't think I could do it. Uh, not, not, that, not that it's bad, I mean, it turns out white can just say rook f1 and say, ah, whatever, take all the pawns you want, your king's gonna have some problems later. But to me, this isn't human. What was very human was to play queen h5. And this move, I think, is just quite strong. With the idea that after bishop g6, for instance, you play queen h3. And next, this rook coming into e6. An idea which I'm sure Fabiano had to see. There's no way he didn't see it. Is quite strong. So, I actually have a slightly different hypothesis than a lot of people here for why Fabiano plays this. Because again, people are talking about, well, it's a position he's playing too slowly. It's a position you have to play quickly. Which is absolutely true. But there's no way he wasn't aware of that. I think that if you play h3, there's only one way you play h3, and that is if you miss black's next move. Because on almost any move, if rook f7, I mean, first of all, there aren't that many moves. If black just passes, if black plays even queen e7, on almost every move, black's position looks ugly. You can play knight c4 next. You can play rook e1 next. If black does not have the move Carlson played in the game, White's position is pretty much dominating. And Fabiano's move turns from one which is kind of mediocre. I shouldn't say mediocre, it isn't a good move. But to one which is just great and does the job perfectly. And that move is queen e8. The way you can avoid situations like this, because let's look at the position after queen e8. All of a sudden, black's problems are largely solved. You don't have queen h5 anymore. The queen can head to g6, next move. Then you're threatening g4, which is already a problem, so probably white's going to have to trade down, and that's what happened. I can just show you very quickly. Knight c4, queen g6, and then he traded, and here, what have you got? You can't really use the diagonal on black's king so easily, so he played h4 to break up the pawns, but once you trade to an endgame, your chances of winning just really go away largely. And Magnus, of course, found the best move here, as he often does with h5. Securing the g4 square for the bishop, he doesn't care so much about preserving his pawn. Which is absolutely correct, and he drew this very easily. But let's go back to this queen e8 move. It solves every black problem. So there's only one way you're not going to play h3, assuming he was trying to win, which of course he was. The only way you don't play rook e queen e8 is if you don't look for it. Uh, sorry, the only way you don't spot queen e8 from white's perspective is if you don't look for it. This is a kind of mistake I see happen a lot. And I tell all my students this kind of thing, and again, at this level, it's a completely different animal. But at the same time, it's the same mistake that, you know, I've made countless times that probably most of you have made, which is that you simply don't look for your opponent's next move. You see h3, you think, all right, I have him under control, but you don't look for this move. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily why Fabiano made this mistake. As I pointed out, this video is not for him so much. <laughs> uh, I can't really presume to do that, but... I think that for most of us, the reason why we would play this is because we miss queen e8. So it's very important not only to know how to approach the position, whether to play it aggressively, to play it more solidly, but it's important to make sure you're always spotting your opponent's next move, especially if you think you have them in a bind. Make sure they don't have that move which solves all their problems. Because oftentimes, if your opponent has one move which finds, which just takes care of everything and solves their problems, they're probably going to find it. And if your opponent's name is Magnus Carlsen, pretty much 100% of the time he's going to find it. 
if you give him that chance. And sure enough, Queen E8 was played and the game was drawn and pretty much Fabiano's best chance to win, maybe apart from game six, which is, by the way, a fascinating game, maybe my favorite of the match. Uh, he definitely had his chances there, including the infamous mate in 36. But I'd say this, this position really he had almost more chances as far as practically to win the game. But spending the too much time on c5 and missing queen e8 was all that cost him. Again, luckily in most of your games, you will have a little bit more leeway than he did. But at the same time, the same thought process often leads to that mistake. All right, next one. So this one is kind of an interesting one because I, I flop my opinion, at least as far as from Fabiano's perspective goes. Uh, my opinion changed uh, a tiny bit. But from the perspective of the rest of us, and by the rest of us I mean normal human beings, not superhuman <laughs> superhuman players, um, his next move was definitely a mistake in this position, and actually we should flip it because this was, uh, Fabiano was black in this game. So here he took on F3, and pretty much every GM watching was like, what on earth are you doing, man? You're just, you're just a, lot, a bad position. And then he showed all of us by drawing it with almost consummate ease. Granted, after a, a, a little bit of a slip-up by Magnus. But even so, it was quite quite an interesting moment. But I would say that this is, again, an example of two things. Magnus surprised him in the opening, uh, as he did actually quite a few times. I would say that he had uh, a, bit, a bit more in the tank against black pieces than he did against Karyak. And he still was more impressive with black than white, but definitely... Magnus, uh, with the white pieces, did a little bit more. And this was a game where he definitely had something. So they had this position, and again, it's not such a horrible position, but the fact is that in this particular position, Fabiano did not have that much time. So this is where making sure you save your time, this is an excellent example. Because it's not like he's going to lose on time, but time impacted his decision. Fabiano took an f3, and he did not do it, in my opinion, because he thought it was the best move. He almost certainly knew this was a, not a good move. But the reason why he played it was because it, he didn't have that much time, and he wanted to simplify the game. So, essentially, the first mistake is just using up too much time, and again, this is move 17. You, you can't have used up all your time here, and this especially goes... And keep in mind, for you guys, it's even more important. You're not facing world championship preparation that was done for hours with computers. Probably not. If you are, then hey, you're doing a great job. But for the most part, none of us have to deal with that too much. So you have to, at some point, again, trust your position a little bit, like I mentioned in the uh, last game. Uh, not, not leave everything up to the chess gods, as I mentioned, but like, you know, trust in your position a little bit. And, you know, you can't have every problem solved, but you have to at least play moves which seem very logical. So in this position, there are quite a few ways black can try to play, but okay, let, let's just say you play queen d7, then follow it up with a move like rook a d8. I would say that white definitely is a little bit better. Incidentally, the bishop on b6, I, I didn't like this placement. On f8, I think it would be maybe slightly happier, but it's also kind of tricky to put a bishop on f8. He wanted to put pressure on the center. Um, but the main idea here, eventually you'd like to play for c5. Uh, if all the miners, for example, left the board here, white would have a very nice advantage simply because this pawn structure is much nicer, these pawns are never as happy, and white can actually put pressure on the queen side. It's one of the few structures where you actually really put pressure on the side of the board where you have fewer pawns. And it's because these pawns are a little bit weak. But okay, the pawns are far from coming off. There's lots of material, there's lots of things that can happen. Uh, so, for example, white can try bishop c3 with the idea to prevent knight a5 to c4. Playing knight a5 earlier, by the way, was definitely an option. But okay, you go to c4, and here white can play a move like queen d3. White can play a4, trying to play a5 on you, so they force you to do this. And okay, probably white's better, but definitely a playable position. He could have also played rook d8, as I mentioned. And then, for example, knight e7, even a move like king h8, like, again, it's unpleasant, but you're not, getting ra you're not getting killed right away. There's no fire. There's no huge emergency. There are lots of pieces on the board. White has a superior structure, but also, okay, who are we kidding? This bishop on c3 is not a prize either. And there's so much that can happen. Knight e7 was a move I, was a move I thought of, at least, trying to play c5. 
So White will probably try to shut you down with this. Rookie one, for example, trying to play e4, so you prevent it. And then bishop b4 was what I came up with trying to prevent knight d6, with the idea that, okay, you can play knight d6, but in this structure, white should be a bit better. But again, it's nothing, you know, that's tragic, you know? The position's sort of okay. You have a slightly worse structure. So much can happen. So for most of us, 99% of it, this is for sure the way to go. Uh, whether you play with rook d8 or knight a5 earlier, some line like this. But it's a very common thing to do, even among strong players, where when we don't like our position, we think we're maybe a bit worse, especially if we think our opponent's better prepared or has more time, we have a tendency to want to simplify the game too much. And the fact is that after his move, bishop takes f3, queen b3 check, it looks fancy, but it's kind of an irrelevant detail. The important detail is that white has the move e3 here. Of course, if you were to take first and I go here, you have some issues with the bishop and the f2 square and all of this. So it was rather nice to play e3 first, and Fabiano correctly just ignores the bishop and goes right for the uh, d-file, because there was no good discovery with the pawn on e3. And in this position, okay, this was played, queen back d7. So here, Magnus actually screwed it up a little bit, and we, I'll actually talk about this almost certainly in a future video, because <laughs> for one of Magnus's mistakes was not pressing more here. But the fact is that, okay, white has a worse king, definitely some weak light squares. The pawn on f7 would make things a little bit cleaner, to be sure. And this bishop on b6 is not a pawn, but it's a very poor piece, and... The white bishop can easily get back into the fray, and white will play for attack. And basically, it's just a one-sided position where you have nothing but misery. So again, for someone of Fabiano's level... Now, Fabiano, he knew what to do. He played g6, he put the king on g7. Magnus actually advanced his pawn a little bit too early, which helped him along. But basically, he could have suffered here a long time. And if you have this position, most likely you will suffer a long time, and your odds of losing are not so small. So for most of us, who don't defend like Fabiano does, this would be a huge mistake. But because he didn't have time, he played this way in order to get a position where he knew he was worse, but he knew exactly how to defend, and he could play much more quickly. But once again, I would say that if most of us play this in our games, if a student of mine had played this, I would have pointed out that this is not a good way to play objectively. And also, it's very one-sided. Having to play a position where you can only lose and you have to suffer forever is not really all that fun. So in any case, uh, that's what I have about this one. Let's do one more. So I could do definitely several of these, but I fear if I make the video too long, you guys will fall asleep, and perhaps I will also. So this was a very sharp, interesting battle in game 10. And really, they both had their chances throughout this game, uh, but most of the chances definitely were in Magnus's corner. And a lot of it stemmed from this position, where at least... It, Right now, Fabiano's doing quite okay. He played an enterprising idea in the opening with b4. They have some kind of mess. Obviously, in general, white's going to be playing queenside, black on the king side, but it's not so simple as that. And here, Fabiano played a move, which, again, I would say in his case, I'm sure I would have a harder time criticizing as far as the thought process, just because I'm sure lots of calculation and thought went into his move. But had a student played his move, I would have called it ever so slightly artificial in that it looks useful on the surface, but in a lot of positions, I think that it doesn't necessarily serve a purpose that it ought to. And clearly, we're in a very sharp position where every move matters a lot. So Black's main idea here is to play, let's just say white does nothing, just for fun, is to play kind of like this. You go for this, you go for a move like this, and then, of course, you would have to play here. Then I can go to e5 or f6, the bishop comes out, and you start attacking. Very fearsome looking. And to be honest, as white, I would certainly not be comfortable. But this is the kind of thing you, you want to deal with. So there are plenty of options you have here. You can play weird-looking moves like bishop h5 with the idea just to just put the pawn on g6 to prevent the queen from coming out. A little bit too funky for me. I mean, after g6, for example, you don't really want to go to g4 because I come out, and yes, you trade the bishops, but I come out with tempo. Your knight doesn't have a good square. This is not what you're looking for. So you'd have to go back, and okay, a little bit too much for me. 
But it's definitely a move. You can play bishop c7 with the idea that after rook f6, you can play, you know, rook e1. Or, and the point is you're taking squares away from black's pieces. But okay, I don't, I don't think it's necessary to put the bishop there just now. Um, so the move which everyone said, seemed to agree was the best after the game was rook e1. So this move looks a little bit funky at first, but the main idea is to combat the move e4. Uh, which again, at least if I'm viewing it from White's point of view, is the move that scares me the most. So, okay, if queen g6, for example, you can play bishop c7. And the idea is mainly that you're preventing knight to f6. And note how if e4, you can hit the queen with bishop h5, which is quite annoying. Uh, black can, of course, play knight f6. But you still have this bishop c7 move, and now you have to be careful, because it seems like this is a blunder due to the exchange winning idea. But black can bring the queen out here, and again, I, I think objectively maybe is decent for white, but you have to be very careful. Uh, this kind of exchange sack with bishops coming out, knights coming out, I would at least be slightly worried. But objectively speaking, you know, maybe after a move like bishop f3, for instance, or something like this, the uh, it's not super, super dangerous. And the other advantage you have here is if queen g6, you actually have this bishop d3 move as well as bishop c7. And the idea is that you take over the e4 square and force the queen away. And next you can play bishop c7, for example. So rook e1 definitely gives you a lot of nice options. And one of the key ideas after e4 is that now you can actually play tactically. You play bishop h5, and you can actually grab this pawn. With the idea that after g takes, you play queen e1. And this bishop experiences huge problems. Note how if you play knight uh, rook f7, then knight takes d6 is winning immediately. Maybe the best try is to do this. So if you move the knight, then I take your rook. But you can actually just slide back. And even now, after takes takes, with d6 coming in, you win your piece back. So this would actually be quite good for white. Okay, to find rook e1 is not an easy thing. You could say that for Fabi Fabiano, maybe you should find it. But for most of us, I wouldn't necessarily expect that. And I wouldn't even call rook a3 such a horrible mistake um, by most, for most players. But the problem with it, and a, a mistake that I think a lot of people do make, is that it, uh, it doesn't deal with the a exact problem. You have a position like this. It's easy to play a move like rook a3 thinking, okay, I cover my queen side, my king side. With my rook, I, I help discourage f3, it's just generally useful. And then kind of stop a little too soon. In a position like this, which is so concrete, where black has very specific ideas on how to hurt you, it's important that your moves are precise, not necessarily precise as in specific orders or something like this, but precise as in your move specifically contributes to hurting a setup of your opponents, or preventing an idea, or executing a very important one of your own. And I think rookie one accomplishes that, and rookie three does not. So that's, I think, what at least most of us can take away from it. Again, I'm sure Fabiano played rookie three with a lot of stuff in mind. But I think that for most of us, it's important to take away that, okay, we have a position like this, we really need to accomplish something a little bit more concrete. And rookie one does that. And just to illustrate how the rook on a3 can be unfortunate, in the game, Magnus played this way. So note how bishop h5 is no longer in the air because this pawn just does not hang. King h1 was played. And here Magnus played the move b5, which, again, after the game, I think people weren't sure it was accurate. But to me, I thought this was an amazing move. Uh, and the idea is that after a takes b6, the rook on a3 is horribly placed because after it takes takes, and now black can even play the move f3. I think even after knight e5 or some move like this, uh, I was pretty unhappy with white's position. But okay, even after f3, which is very aggressive and strong, knight comes to e5, black has a huge attack, and it's all because this knight lands on a3. Fabiano very wisely played knight b6, but after the trade and you know Magnus developed, it was clear that... I think Magnus played here. It was quite clear that... Okay, maybe the position was, or sorry, uh, this is where Magnus played queen g5, I think, which is maybe not so good. In any case, it wasn't, I didn't want to focus on the rest of the game, which, as fascinating as it was, it was more that 
this led to a position where clearly I, I thought Black was having most of the fun, and sure enough, I think Magnus was maybe the one pressing for the majority of this game. Uh, of course, as we saw, Fabiano defended like a monster, like he did the whole match. But the fact remained that I thought that he kind of had a position where maybe he was a little bit better, but okay, it, it doesn't matter so much. But he had a very clear way to continue that uh, was quite promising. And instead, he ended up with this weird rook on a3, which ended up getting bounced around and allowed black to achieve a lot more. So anyway, I hope you guys found that that useful. And again, I mean, it, there's so much out there on the World Championship. I really didn't want to just analyze the games. As you, as you guys saw, there were a few moments where uh, I didn't even have my notes quite in order. So <laughs> it, it was more, I really wanted to, what I did spend a lot of time was on focusing on moments where I thought that there was a thought process that we could all learn from, uh, more so than analyzing the games from an objective point of view with, you know, an engine or something like that, or even without an engine. It's uh, a completely different task and one which a lot of people will undertake, but it's not really what I was aiming for with these videos. So uh, that being said, I'm, I'm definitely, haven't done a video in a while, I got to get back into the video practice. So on that note, I'm, I'm definitely going to come out with the Magnus video rather soon. So stay tuned for that. And I hope you enjoyed this one. So I'll see you guys next time.